Welcome. Uh, today I want to give a brief introduction to the corpus of um, Willa Cather. And I consider Willa Cather to be the greatest American novelist and one of the greatest novelists of all time, rivaling Jane Austen and Fyodor Dostoevsky. Now I am sure you might sit back and ask, who is Yenner to make such statements? Such a question is well warranted. So I thought I would begin my talk discussing how I came to study and write about Willa Cather. This will give us an entree into Willa Cather's work as such. I study political philosophy. I am not an English professor, so I got some explaining to do. Political philosophy is a very broad field of study. And to distort a little for the sake of clarity, there are two major questions of political philosophy. What is the good life? And what kind of society promotes living the good life? Thinkers as far back as Plato and Aristotle struggled with these questions, but they were convinced that human beings could reason about the questions. The major contenders for a good life were, for Aristotle and Plato, lives dedicated to cultivating virtue, to pursuing wisdom, to ruling the city, and a life dedicated to one's family. Christianity never sought to eclipse these goods, but it added another such good, a life dedicated to piety. These were the reasonable contenders for human dedication, moral virtue, philosophy, political life, family life, and piety. These goals contended for supremacy in the various cities and in the hearts and minds of those with the leisure to think about what a good life was. Early modern thinkers did not give up on this debate, but they tried to rearrange it to an extent. Here, once again, I must do a bit of violence to what modern thinkers thought in order to keep things clear. Modern thinkers thought all the debates over which way of life was best obscured some fundamental agreement among all those who disagreed. Everyone could surely agree that in order to live a life of moral virtue or pursue wisdom or family life, one must first be alive. Previous political orders had not been stable enough and had not afforded a platform for the securing and hence enhancing of life. New regimes founded on the natural right of self-preservation would allow for such greater stability, greater life, and so on. America itself was born of this movement. This movement always had its critics, and those critics were often philosophical and often literary. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was one such philosophic critic. He argued that political communities dedicated to securing life ultimately undermined human happiness and human completion or wholeness. Political communities dedicated to securing mere life ended up becoming bourgeois regimes, regimes defined by those who were satisfied with securing prosperity and living a small materialistic dream that modern political communities afford. Rousseau set the terms for the debate. Did modern political communities undermine the possibilities of higher things because they emphasized lower things? Rousseau's insights generated or inspired generations of novelists. I am tempted to say that his insight invented the novel, but that would be going too far. Protagonists in many a novel are filled with disgust and longing for something greater than what they see in the everydayness of commercial societies spawned by modern thinkers. Madame Bovary can find no satisfaction in the bourgeois world of her apothecary and a mediocre husband. She ends up dead. Anna Karenina faces the same problem, and she too meets an unfortunate end. Dead. Stendhal's Red and Black also fits in this category, as do the novels of Jane Austen and countless others. The question of the modern novel is often the question of the bourgeois. Is the small, decent pursuit of self-interest compatible with human flourishing or human greatness? What vices and virtues are exhibited in such a life? How can bourgeois life be improved? Can bourgeois life be radically changed? 
This concern that many, if not most, novelists raise is a reflection on the question of political philosophy. Is the modern world consistent with a good life? So it is natural that those who are taken with political philosophy are very much interested in the modern novel. This summer I have read The House of Mirth and A Farewell to Arms, and I am reading War and Peace. These are questions of those books, too. It is in this context that I was first exposed to the writings of Willa Cather. The first I ever read of her was in the early 1990s, and immediately I was completely taken with the beauty and purposefulness of her writing. No word is wasted. No possibility unexplored. An immense seriousness about the fate of mankind in the modern world. Beautiful writer, deep thinker. So unlike the great wasteland of American writers of the post World War I times, she understands and she presents hu human alienation more deeply and beautifully than Hemingway. Her World War I novel, One of Ours, is infinitely deeper than Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms or The Sun Also Rises. She grasps the problem of American bourgeois life more deeply than Sinclair Lewis or Upton Sinclair or any of the other progressive novelists, novelists who put their talents in the service of social reform more than Cather ever would or could. The first novel of hers that I read was A Lost Lady. I was immediately hooked on Cather. This brings me to the meat of this talk on Cather, for as I studied Cather, I came to realize that her views on the question of the bourgeois order underwent a profound change in the course of her writing, and she herself advertised this change. She changed her views on America and the possibility of human thriving there. This is what I call Cather's Turns. Her initial novels are much more pro-America, in the sense that she thought the American order could be reconciled with an appreciation for human greatness and the human goods of piety or political greatness or philosophic contemplation or a moral virtue. These novels include My Antonia, Song of the Lark, and O Pioneers, novels for which she is quite famous. Then, soon after World War I, Cather sensed a crisis of this order, and she gave an account of that crisis in her two middle novels, A Lost Lady and One of Ours. Cather resolved this crisis, in a manner of speaking, in her later novels, novels that do not get the attention they deserve. Shadows on the Rock is the main resolution, though A Professor's House, My Mortal Enemy, Lucy Gayhart, and Death Comes for the Archbishop also partake of this resolution. So what I would like to do with the rest of this talk is put forward this framework within which to understand Cather's career as a novelist and the development of her thinking on the question that many, if not most, novelists are concerned. And I will continue this talk in the second part.